Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at Morphe's taking a look at a Remington revolving rifle. It really shouldn't come as any surprise that both of the major manufacturers of revolvers in the Old West era of US history both got into making revolving rifles, but they did so for rather different reasons. Colt got into the revolving rifle game in the 1850s, looking for military contracts and big sales and hoping, hoping to open up a whole new market and another way to exploit their patent on revolver technology. Uh, they did, in fact, get a, a military contract, although it wasn't a particularly big one, and it didn't really lead to much. The revolving rifle, Colt discovered, wasn't really a path to any particular success. Well, some ten years later, Remington gets into the revolving rifle market, and they do so for, well, they're just looking for an extra way to sell some of the stuff that they've already paid for, really. Uh, and Remington markets their revolving rifle as a hunting weapon. So what they essentially did is they took the existing tooling for the Remington New Model. Uh, as a little side note here, the Remington New Model is often called the Remington Model 1858, because I believe one of the reproduction companies started advertising it as that. That is based on a patent date on the original guns. That's not actually the date of introduction, and it's not their designation. It is the Colt New Model, or the Remington New Model, sorry. Uh, Remington took that revolver and essentially took the stock for the, the Remington Beals rifle that they were starting to make, threw that on the back end, and threw a big long barrel on the front end, and presto, they can offer a new pattern of firearm without really having to invest in any new tooling. When Colt did a revolving rifle, they made a whole new frame size. Like the Colt revolving rifles went up to 50 some caliber, 56 caliber, I believe. Uh, for Remington, they just took their existing two frames. So there are two versions of this. There is a 36 caliber version and a 44 caliber version. These were introduced in 1865, and doesn't take long. And by the way, 1865 as percussion guns, so 36 and 44 caliber percussion guns. The 36 tended to be the more common, the more popular of the two, by about a two to one margin. Um, a whole lot of variations available, different style of sights. You could get a couple different barrel lengths, fancy, not fancy, kind of what you would expect for commercial hunting rifles. You have a lot of different options if you're willing to pay extra for stuff. So it fairly quickly became obvious that you know, percussion was not the way of the future, cartridges were the way of the future. And by 1872, Remington was offering this in its catalog as a cartridge conversion version of the gun. Uh, why 1872? Because of course people knew about cartridges, were using cartridges several years earlier, but 1871 was the end of uh, the Smith & Wesson patent on board through cylinders. So there was actually a batch of Remington pistols that were converted to cartridge uh, prior to 1872, but that was actually done with the agreement of Smith & Wesson and paying them a, a royalty on their patent for the board through cylinder. Uh, anyway, 1872 we have cartridges. The 36 percussion becomes the 38 long rimfire version. The 44 caliber percussion becomes the 46 long rimfire version. What we have here is one of the 38 rimfires. So let's take a closer look at exactly what Remington did with this. When you see it up close, you can see that this is clearly just a Remington new model revolver with a long stock and a long barrel on it. So now this one is a, uh, a factory rimfire conversion. So the original ones would have had a cylinder here with six shots and six percussion cap nipples and a hammer that was set up to fire percussion caps. Here the hammer has been reshaped as a rimfire hammer, and we have a two-part cylinder actually. So we'll go ahead and let's put that down there. In order to unload this, we're going to take the loading rod and drop it down. Obviously you don't need this anymore. This would have been uh, for ramming projectiles home in a percussion cylinder. Then we can slide out the cylinder access pin and pull out the cylinder. So uh, these were originally six shot guns in both 38 or 36 and 44 caliber percussion. When the conversion to rimfire was done, uh, the 36 became six rounds of 38. The 44 became five rounds of 46 caliber rimfire because there just wasn't enough space in the cylinder for six shots. So the way this works is you have a back plate on the cylinder, and there is a pin right here that lines up with 
that hole just to keep everything properly aligned. This gives you all of the ratchet mechanisms necessary to work with the existing lock of the revolver. And we've got rebated cylinders here, so you drop your six rimfire cartridges in, put the back plate back on the cylinder, and you can see that there's a little window for each cartridge where the rim pokes through. That's where the hammer is going to hit. Um, you can fire all six, and then you have to take the thing apart, poke out the empty cases, and reload it. It is still a single action mechanism, so a bunch of clicks there, cocks the hammer, and fire. We have a very traditional style of pointed buttstock here. As I said, the stock was basically taken from the Remington Beals rifle. And you could get fancy versions, fancy wood if you wanted to. Most people did not. There were also a variety of rear sights used. This is the buckhorn style. Note that they have opened up a nice deep channel in the top frame of the, well, the top of the frame, the top strap of the frame, so that you can see the rear sights through it. All octagonal barrel, as most of them were, but you could get a round barrel if you wanted. There's your front sight. Uh, standard barrel lengths were 24, 26, and 28 inches. This one is 26. And again, custom barrel lengths were available. There's at least one 22 and one 30 inch that are out there known to exist. Again, you know, with sporting rifles like this, whatever you wanted, if you're willing to pay for it, generally speaking, the factory is willing to do it for you. I should say, the one change that they did make between the revolver and the rifle was they actually extended this loading uh, rod by a couple inches, uh, ramrod, so that you had a little more purchase, a little more leverage on it to load cartridges. That wasn't feasible on the revolver, simply because of its barrel length, but it's easy enough to do on a rifle version, and so why not? Makes it a little bit easier for people to load. In general, the small frame guns were a bit more popular than the large frame guns. About two-thirds of production appears to have been 36 slash 38 caliber. And then once you have those guns, about 50% of the known examples have been converted to rimfire, and the other 50% remain percussion guns. Remington did these uh, conversions in the factory, of course, but there were also private gunsmiths who could do the same work for you if you wanted. And so you will find occasionally other styles of rimfire conversion out there that were done by independent gunsmiths. The grand total of production over about 13 years of production was 800 guns. So we're talking you know, something on the order of 50 to 60 guns per year. This wasn't a particularly popular gun. Now the problem for Remington was that these things never really sold very well. Uh, when they were first introduced, they would sell for $31 to $33, depending on barrel length, or they were asking $31 to $33. Uh, the listings in, in Remington's catalog run until 1879. That's the last catalog where this rifle actually appears. And by that point, the price had dropped about 20%. And now they were $25 for any barrel length. We just want to get rid of these things. The problem was, well, there are problems endemic to revolving rifles. You have splash around the cylinder gap. As a percussion gun, you have the risk of chain fire, although with rimfire you can actually get rid of that risk. Rimfire gun's not going to, not going to chain fire on you. But in order to reload this, you have to take the whole cylinder out. It's not a very convenient thing. This is very much a conversion of a percussion gun into cartridges. And by 1879-1880, you've got a lot of really good options if you want a light carbine that's going to have a power, you know, ballistic potential equal to this 38 long rimfire or 46 long rimfire. Winchester's got a ton of lever action rifles that will do everything that this Remington revolving rifle will do, and they'll do really quite a lot more, and they'll do it better. So this was not a particularly successful product for Remington. They're quite rare today. On the other hand, Remington really didn't have to invest very much into creating this, because, as I said at the beginning, they already had all the tooling for the actions. They didn't really change anything there. They just reshaped the tangs a little bit to fit a rifle stock. Even the rifle stock came off of a single-shot rifle that Remington was making and selling at that same time. So it's just a matter of put a long barrel on and let's see if anyone buys it. And a few people did, uh, enough that they got produced, and we get to take a look at some interesting ones here. Uh, Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.